Welcome to Beth Torah Congregation. I'm, some of you may have never been here before. This is, you're sitting in our new as of 2009 building. We're very proud of our space. We feel that it uh, creates sacred space for even mundane things. Tonight is far from mundane. I want to let you all know <coughs> if you've left your coffee on the carpet, don't worry about it. We have modular tiles. We can pick up one at a time and change them. They are designed for spilling. You know, one of my uh, favorite things was being able to tell my shul that after 20 years I'm getting bored. And I said, I don't want to risk becoming a bingo caller where every week I just call out the same pages in the blue book. So I said, I want to do something really interesting. And they said, what do you want to do? I said, well, sort of under the category of trading your donkey for an ass, I said, I want to start another Jewish organization. And they said, why would you want to do that? I said, I don't know, because I, I, cause even though I don't always love everything about the community, like Warren Buffett says, I don't always love the stock, but I love the business. And I love the experience of being Jewish, and I love the place, and I love the, the way we feel when we get together and when we come together in common purpose. <coughs> So I had the privilege of founding Living Jewishly, which is the bringer of experiences to many of the moments in our Jewish lives in which we can engage, and we can engage in a way that is often simple but deeply meaningful, like the Mana Project, for example, which you can talk to a young person who is a former Bar Mitzvah student here, who's here to help you make rainbow layered soup. You feel good about it, you should, because somebody is gonna end up with that soup jar and that's gonna actually sustain them not just in their food insecurity, but also in the sense that people care. And that's why I joined the board of Mazon all those years ago and why I've never, <coughs> never really left the board. I don't think you ever really left the board. I think I know exactly how much we allocated to sistering in 2009. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I have the notes upstairs. You don't really leave because it's, it's an internal project. It's something that comes from a very deep place. And uh, when I had the opportunity to host and to work together with Mazon for Living Jewishly, <coughs> we said yes, of course. And it's really wonderful to see familiar faces and most importantly to see the faces of people who make a difference. And uh, that's what we want. We want people who have had the experience of participating in the meaningfulness of community. And we've opened our space and our shul for these types of events because we believe that's how we can get back, both from Beth Torah's perspective and Living Jewishly's perspective. I am thrilled to share with you one of the best things about Living Jewishly, which is your, your guest for this evening, which is Dr. Elliot Malamet, who I have a lot of <coughs> admiration for his intellect and his warm personality. Elliot, you gotta give him some of the warm personality tonight. You can't just give him the <laughs> intellect. But uh, Elliot, is a, El Elliot is a great thinker and a, uh, a wonderful friend and a colleague. And nothing makes me happier than knowing that the people who give and the people who care will also be given the context in which to be able to speak those words to other people and tell them, you know what I learned? I learned something really great about giving or about what it means or how to think about it. That's what we hope for. We hope that we can deepen your Jewish connection and that's why uh, I'm happy to welcome you all to our home this evening. So I'm gonna turn it over to Izzy, your fabulous executive director. And Izzy, you work really hard. It's all yours and thank you for being here and I'm delighted to have you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave the mic. I don't feel like we need it. I'll grab this podium. <laughs> Great. Now I'm just not standing here with my notes in my hands. All right. So um, thank you so much for coming tonight. I am so excited to be here. Um, as you may or may not know, Mizzou Canada has a really small staff and a really small board. Five people on the board, three people in the, on the staff. And being in 
this, a room full of this many people who really share a passion for this mission is just a really exciting day for me and it feels really, really good, especially to be able to turn uh, so many of the, the voices I hear on the phone and names on the computer into you know, faces and hands I can shake. So if I haven't gotten a chance to introduce myself personally yet and thank you for coming out and ask how you got involved, please let me shake your hand uh, before you leave this evening. Uh, we are going to have a really wonderful night. We have um, David Wannon is here representing Haven Toronto, um, one of those on Canada's grantees, um, and I'll say a little more about that soon. And of course, um, Dr. Elliot Malamet is going to be wonderful. Um, but I'd actually like to introduce myself a little deeper before we go any further. Uh, my name is Izzy Waxman. I was hired at Amazon three and a half years ago in a um, communication and outreach capacity. And uh, I took the directorship two years ago. Um, I also want to point out um, Shoshana Kudin, who's here, um, who's our communication specialist, and Betty Gertner, who just snuck out of the room to talk to Elliot. So <laughs> she's the one with the um, side sweat bangs, who, who is the mastermind behind the, uh, the soup jar project that you did, Mana Project, Soup Jar Project. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to meet her yet, please do. Um, yeah, so, you know, coming on board Mazan, I think I realized since, I think even before my first interview, since as soon as I heard about the position and heard about what Mazan was doing and got the interview, um, I've just known that it was the opportunity of a lifetime for me. It seems almost redundant to tell this room of people uh, exactly how important Mazan's work is because this room is full of some of our most dedicated, generous, and long-term supporters. Um, you're already here tonight because you know how important this work is and you know that you have the power as a supporter of Mazan to change the story for so many vulnerable people. But nonetheless, uh, it is hard sometimes to feel connected with people on the receiving end. And when you're going to sleep in a warm bed at night, uh, you know, with your heat turned on and breakfast ready in the pantry or in the refrigerator, um, it is hard to keep in mind daily how many people so close to us don't have that and exactly how close they are. Uh, without boring you with any statistics, I do want to say this. Prices of housing, prices of food, prices of medication are skyrocketing in Ontario and across Canada. And the issue of whether to pay rent or your heating bill or your cell phone bill or put food on the table is a question that is no longer reserved for the most vulnerable 1% of society. These are questions that hardworking people, average people, are increasingly having to ask, and it's devastating. And I know this because I see my community struggle. <clears throat> These aren't abstract problems to me. I was lucky enough that I went to a private school in the Jewish community. I grew up around people who also, for the most part, had food on the table, got a good education, and were set up for pretty stable adult lives. But as I left that world and stepped into my adult life, I increasingly met people who did not have those opportunities, and I'm really watching how different a life can turn out if you aren't given those things at the start. This work doesn't end for me at 5 p.m. When I leave the office, my friends are people who skip breakfast and who eat a granola bar for dinner. People who post on Facebook to ask a friend for a loan just to get them through food until their next paycheck. Um, my community is a friend whose rent just jumped 25% overnight since rent controls were struck down in Ontario and doesn't know what she's going to have to cut in order to pay that increase. And it very likely will be food because that's the fl most flexible thing in most people's budgets. My community is cooking for a friend who's saving every penny that she can because she's fleeing an abusive partner and doesn't know how she's going to make ends meet next month. She doesn't know how she's going to pay rent. My community is a friend with an agonizing health condition who's living on a grand a month and paying from the government and paying $800 of it in rent just to see a roof over their head. That person is surviving on ramen noodles, plain rice, and drinking water to save off hunger most days. In short, my community is full of good people who are doing their best but are facing hard times. And these people are young and working age. This says nothing about seniors in our community who we are failing every day and leaving isolated, unfed, and uncared for, and young children who have no control over the families that they are born into. And my community is only a small part of the four million Canadians 
who are making these impossible choices between food and other critical living expenses every day. And that's why leaving, leading Muslim Canada has been the chance of a lifetime for me. To speak more about the issues that are faced by Canadians in need, I'd like to, invest, to invite a wonderful guest to the stage. Um, he's here tonight representing Haven Toronto, a shelter for elder homeless men in downtown Toronto. Please welcome David Wennan. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm also a donor. Um, my wife and I donate because we've got kids, 12 and 14, uh, who have never missed a meal, never gone to school hungry. We recognize the programs that uh, Mazan Canada provides in making sure the kids that go to school uh, have a meal and the impact of having a meal on their education. Not, not going to school hungry because when they go to school hungry, it impacts their ability to learn. So we, we give. But, so I have a different perspective. I've got a perspective as a donor, and I've got a perspective as, as an organization that benefits from the resources, from your donations. And we're grateful for that at Haven Toronto. Haven Toronto is a drop-in center for men who are uh, age 50 plus. Uh, we're the only facility in Canada that actually is dedicated to that unique group. Um, there are all kinds of organizations for families, for youth, for, for young adults, for children, uh, for single women, but this is it for, for, for men age 50 plus. The kind of people that we look after, you know, when we look at the stats, 75% of our clients are, are um, uh, homeless, 25% are precariously housed, some of them um, living in rooming houses, some of them might be illegal, um, and 100% of the people that we serve are food insecure. We have about four or 5,000 clients a year that we, we see. We see about 400 clients a day at Haven Toronto, in, in downtown Toronto, and uh, what we use to, to get them in the doors the number one thing is food. Food is a gateway for us. And, and we receive funding from Mazan Canada to be able to provide the food that we offer, which is healthy, nutritious, Canada Food Guide related uh, meals. If you're, if you're a meat lover, we've got you covered. If you're a vegetarian, we've got you covered. You, you know, it doesn't matter what your palate is. But we aren't able to offer that kind of uh, uh, first step, that gateway, without your support. So first of all, to the Jewish community and, and to you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what I mean by a gateway is, you know, give you an example of some of the people that we serve. You know, there's Patrick. Patrick is uh, in his late 60s. Uh, he's homeless. Uh, he used to live in a shelter. He used to live in a shelter that was just all men. The challenge with being age 50 plus is, you know, you, know, you have unique health needs. They, they have uh, challenges that are unique to that demographic. But they're also one of the most vulnerable groups in the community. People who are 50 plus or uh, 50, age 50 or older, um, when you're in a shelter, they're a target. When a young guy needs some quick cash, they usually look to the old people who can't take care of themselves, can't look after themselves. Patrick is one of those guys. He's living in a shelter, uh, he's beaten, and he's robbed um, for something as simple as a, a, a phone cord for his, his phone. Uh, and today, Patrick uh, lives on the side of the DVP. That's my choice. Patrick lives on the side of the DVP because he actually feels safer exposed to mother nature than he does exposed to human nature. So you should know that every time you drive the DV, DVP, Patrick's out there. You know, he's out there no matter what the weather is. Another client of ours is a guy named George. George is, he turned 70 this year, he's homeless. Now, George has a pension, it's just not enough to live on. You know, George is an individual who, who has some health challenges. Our on-site nurse provides support. And, and George sees our nurse almost daily, guaranteed weekly, and, and our doctor on Tuesdays. But what got George into the building was the fact that he couldn't afford accommodations, uh, he couldn't afford meals, he couldn't afford a number of different things that we take for granted. You know, we, we provide meals, we provide showers, we provide laundry, on-site nurse, counselors, a, a doctor, housing. But some of our clients come to us because we have free Wi-Fi. Some come because we have a clothing room that they can get emergency clothing. Patrick, a few weeks ago, asked for a second sleeping bag so that he could double his up when he was living on the side of the DVP to get through the winter and stay a bit warmer. George, a year and a half ago, was bit by a dog waiting at a transit shelter and is still suffering the consequences of it because, you see, when you're homeless, everything takes longer. George is unhealthy. When he, we had a nurse start full-time this year, and within a few days, the nurse had met with George, and they, they recognized that George had, and this is a nurse that's been around for years, 
had the worst case of bed bugs they've ever seen in any human being. George uses our facility for meals. He comes in for the meals. He stays for the companionship. He, he now utilizes the nursing services. He doesn't utilize the housing services because even if he could find a place, he can't afford it. We advertised in house the other day that there was a really spacious uh, room for rent at $700. Some of our clients, they're lucky if they get $733 a month. So if they were to rent that place, they would have $33 or a dollar a day to get through the rest of the month. George doesn't live in a house. He lives on the streets in Toronto at the age of 70. Uh, George is also a donor. George donates money to our organization because he wants to make sure our services are there for people who are less fortunate. We're very grateful for your support. We're very grateful for the ability to do what we do and having an impact on people's lives. We change their lives. I see it on a daily basis. You mentioned it early on with the introduction that one of the things is that you, you leave people with a sense of hope, and that's what we do. We give them hope, we give them dignity, and, and we, we, we reduce the stigma of, of homelessness. But it starts with that food. It starts with a healthy meal, three times a day. Last year we did 55,000 meals. You talk about being short on staff, or thin, or just low on numbers. Don't know what you want to call it. But the reality is we're, we're very similar for an organization that provides services. We did 55,000 meals with one cook and volunteers. Now, if you had the luxury of volunteering, the one thing you will leave, and we hear this all the time, is you'll leave saying you cannot get over the quality of the food. It's truly remarkable. The fruits, the vegetables, the, the, the meats, the dairy. I mean, providing eggs is a luxury. So I just want to thank you. It's, what we do is important. I'm amazed at, at some of the stories that we hear about and some of the outcomes that we see, the impact we have. And, and it's because of you. Thank you. And, you know, I definitely saw some wet eyes in the room. And it is, it's just such a heartbreaking thing to see such vulnerable people. And, you know, they need warriors. And you're out there on that battlefront every day fighting for their safety and for their dignity. So can we have another round of applause for David, please? That was just so Um, so food and the role that food plays in all of this. Uh, it is true that food is just one piece of this bigger puzzle of poverty and unmet needs in Canada, but it's a critical one. Um, because a, a month of food is a flexible line in a home's budget, it's often the first thing that gets squeezed. But skipping meals, under eating, or eating cheap junk or plain carbs will create health problems down the line. And it's true that people in Canada rarely starve to death, but they do die of diabetes and they do die of wounds that can't heal because their bodies just don't have the fuel. That was, you know, I was thinking about that actually as you brought up George. A Canadian, found, a Canadian study found that a malnourished patient is six times more likely than a well-nourished one to die within 30 days of surgery. That's real, that's happening here in Canada. Don't make the mistake of thinking that hunger doesn't kill right here at home. From chicken soup, to oranges, we all know our comfort foods and our healing foods that we go to when we get sick. We know that food is medicine. But today, no doctor can prescribe subsidized fruit, vegetables, meat, or dairy to a vulnerable person, no matter how obvious it is that that is the source of so many of their issues. And many people who attend misunfunded community centers or drop-ins, like Haven and like others, uh, only eat proteins, fruits, and vegetables on days that they come to the program. And food is not just for the body, it's for the soul. Studies show that eating alone is an indicator and a cause of lots of health issues. And some studies suggest that isolation, highlighted in lonely dinner times and solitary lunches, can be as, uh, can affect health and mortality to the same order of magnitude as high blood pressure and smoking. Most of our programs bring people together to eat, building relationships with peers who share the same struggles whether that's life on the street, or single parenthood, or both. 
many people get through the door for food and uh, then only then connect with social workers. They can provide them with all these other really life-changing services that are required to make really sustainable change in a person's life and situation. We're proud to ensure that simple things that many of us take for granted, like apples and bananas and a chicken drumstick and a glass of milk are available to these vulnerable people all over Canada. It's preventative medicine. It's breaking bread with your brothers and sisters. It's throwing a wrench into the gears of the cycle of poverty, illness, vulnerability, and death. As a lifelong foodie, sometime home chef, and a big old softie, um, I always knew that I wanted to work in food aid. But I've also, um, and I've also known that I wanted to work in the Jewish world, representing and educating my community. But I think by the end of maybe my first month at Mazon, I found that there was something else really uh, special and unique that convinced me that this was the place for me to invest the majority of my waking hours for the indefinite future. Um, and that was that. So as we mentioned, Mazon, three-person staff, five-person board right now. Um, small team grounded really firmly in being responsive to the needs coming from the community that we're trying to serve, food insecure people in Canada. And uh, having that nimble, committed team, that small committed team, really is actually a gift, it's a treasure. We're not bogged down by uh, generations of red tape and bureaucracy. Uh, we're not committed to um, a single government grant, you know, when we need to move quickly, we can. And we can move uh, really towards the people that we're aiming to support, we're independent. Um, but most small, nimble organizations like that also have a strike against them that Mazon is missing. They're lacking resources. And Mazon is in this really beautiful sweet spot of having something incredible in its back pocket, which is such an incredible, committed, principled, reliable base of donors. It's the people in this room. Um, really, being in that sweet spot makes all the difference. And um, there's four million people in Canada who every day must make impossible choices. Food or a winter coat, food or medicine, food or an apartment instead of sleeping on your mother's couch with your toddler on your chest, and you're here tonight because you each believe that no one should ever have to make these choices and because you understand that you have the power to change that story for someone. Every night across this country, someone walks into a food bank or shelter for the first time feeling confused, feeling ashamed, feeling afraid. And every night across this country, you ensure that there's someone there to greet them with a warm meal and a reassuring hand, a reassuring touch on their shoulder. And someone discovers that they're not alone and that someone else there cares. There's four million people going hungry in Canada. That's four million stories in need of change. And that's why Mazon is serving 450 meals a day through 130 programs across the country, Nunavut to BC to Nova Scotia, uh, and touching the lives of 900,000 people across the country. There's four million avoidable situations and four million pieces to a puzzle to, to bring us to this solution. And the facts are that this country and this planet has enough to feed us all. And we are heartbreakingly inefficient at making sure that the serving platter gets passed to everyone who needs it. And to heal this wound, it takes collaboration. Governments, businesses, families, citizens, everybody needs to be working in coordination. And don't get me wrong, Canada has actually made great leaps and bounds in these directions. Canada has gone much, much farther than many countries have, but there is still far to go. And so to discuss where our responsibilities to this larger community uh, begin and end, I'd like to invite our speaker for the evening to the stage. There he is, hiding in the shadows. Um, Dr. Elliot Malman. Round of applause for you. Speaker, but we're not going to be speaking, we're going to be learning together. Um, and what I want to explore with you tonight is certain fundamental questions, the first of which is what constitutes a good life? 
And part of what COVID in that question is, what's my responsibility to other people? Do I have a responsibility to other people? I don't actually take those questions as givens. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. This topic in, you know, invites a lot of discussion in which people either feel guilty or they feel like, well, I should, but maybe you shouldn't. So what I want to know is why do we have a responsibility to other people and what's the nature of that responsibility? And to do that, I want to explore the first source with you and I want you to tell me what you think. So let's read it together. Okay, source number one. This is a scenario that's given by the philosopher Peter Singer in the opening of his book, The Life You Can Save. Here we go. On your way to work, you pass a small pond. Children sometimes play in the pond, which is only about knee deep. The hour is early, so you're surprised to see a child splashing about in the pond. And as you get closer, you see that it is a very young child. Just a toddler flailing about, unable to stay upright or walk out of the pond. You look for the parents or a babysitter, but there's no one else around. The child is unable to keep his head above the water for more than a few seconds at a time. If you don't wade in and pull him out, he seems likely to drown. Wading in is easy and safe but you'll ruin the new shoes you bought only a few days ago, and you'll get your suit wet and muddy. And by the time you hand the child over to someone responsible for him and change your clothes, you'll be late for work. What should you do? Save the child? Does everybody agree with that? It's pretty obvious. It seems that way, doesn't it? it seems pretty obvious. In fact. And that's, of course, the answer that Professor Singer expects everyone to make. And the argument he's going to make in his book is that every day we let that child drown. Every single day. We're walking by kids in ponds and letting them drown. And that, of course, seems counterintuitive. And I know you're all saying what I said when I first read this, which is I don't let anybody drown. I don't walk by kids and let them drown. So let's see if he can pull this off. We'll come back later to his claim that we let kids drown every day. Is there a Jewish response to hunger? Yes and no. The yes is that when people come to Judaism and they look for help in discussing contemporary social issues, they'll find sources. But they may, may not be the sources that apply directly to the kind of thing you see today, right? Statistics were quoted here earlier about four million people who have food security issues um, in Canada. That kind of number was unknown, right? in Jewish history is on a vast magnitude scale that was never encountered. So the kinds of things you see in Jewish sources will be on a much smaller scale. But the way they're dealt with is interesting. Take a look at source number two. When you reap the harvest of your land, don't wholly reap the corn of your field, leave it for the poor and for the stranger. What's the difference between that and the way we give charity? We wait to be asked, yeah. And what's the nature of our giving? Do people come to your house, knock on your door, take stuff from your kitchen? Right. right, it's a completely different model of giving, right? The way people think about giving in capitalism is there's people out there. They're out there. And I, through some sort of means, give to those people out there and feel good about myself in the process, right? I write a check, I put it in the mail, or sometimes somebody comes to the door, or sometimes we come to meetings like this. But there's a distance, often, between me and the recipient, right? And if anything, they're out there and I'll throw something out to them. In the biblical model, it's the reverse. They're coming to you, you don't have to be there, and what you have is automatically theirs. So the dignity of that is, first of all, the discretion, right? I'm not coming up to you and begging you, 
having to look in your face. And secondly, it's an automatic assumption that what I have has to be shared. And it comes without any kind of um, pat on the back. It comes without any kind of, what a wonderful person you are for sharing your food. It's actually very mundane, very prosaic, very flat. You've got the stuff, take a corner of it, it's not yours anymore. Don't think about it. It's like it doesn't belong to you. Not, oh, I got the stuff and I'm going to be so good. I'm going to give up my stuff to you. No, it's not your stuff. We're slicing it off at the beginning and saying, it's somebody else's stuff now. Don't even think about it. Don't worry about it. Is poverty going to be eradicated? Actually, not in the Bible's view. In the Bible's view, it seems to be a perpetual permanent problem. There's always going to be people who have needs, right? Look at the next source in source two. If there be among you a needy person within any of your gates, do not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your needy brother, but surely open your hand to him and lend sufficient for their need. There's a lot, right, that's encoded in that language. A lot of different items, both financial and emotional. What are some of the things that are inside of this? You don't determine what the other person needs. Indeed, right? So it's not, it's not, well, you and your situation, I think that what you deserve or my calculation of what I think you really need is, so you're actually going on what they seem to need, right? In a very sort of precise, identified way. Quite so, right? What do they actually need? Not just, here's some money. Because people need different things, and that's been pointed out beautifully earlier in this evening. People need physical sustenance. They also need emotional relationship, connection. They need to feel alleviated from isolation. Isolation is not just, you know, I don't have enough friends. Isolation kills people, right? Actually kills people. What else do we see in this language? Right, it's not a matter of doubt, right? This is not like, let's think about it. And that's interesting, you see, because the assumption in that language is not the assumption we have in the modern West. In the modern West, our assumption about giving is, it's an option. It's one of the things that I might do. I'm not a bad person if I don't do it. I am a good person if I do do it. So no blame if I don't, and lots of credit if I do. And uh, maybe I'll spend my money that way, maybe I won't. Here, just like the corner of the field, the attitude here is much more hard-headed. It's not an option. So the assumption is a form of social dynamic, which is that I don't really know how you, the reader, are thinking about it, but I'll tell you how we, the text, is thinking about it, which is this isn't optional. This is life. People have need. We're here to respond to need. This is crucial, right? Because the way we think about life is often choice-oriented. And that's the nature of modernity. Modernity is all about choice. It's the definition of the modern world. It's choosing. In the pre-modern world, there were very few options because of technology, because of the nature of life, right? You usually would grow up in the same place as your parents, your great-grandparents, and their great-grandparents. You'd find somebody from around the block to marry. You'd have kids. You'd get sick. You would die and be buried in the exact same place as them. And this would take place for dozens of generations. You didn't have choices, both because of money, because of lack of mobility, because of lack of technology, because of social expectation. Now everything is chosen. Think about it. Every day you're forced to choose. 
I, for one, find some of these choices quite daunting. When I go into Shoppers Drug Mart, I find it very <laughs> stressful. I do. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Which shampoo? Which of the 40,000 brands of toothpaste one never knew that there could be so nuances in toothpaste? And there are. You are forced to choose. Without even realizing it, you're forced to choose. That's what it means to be alive now. This is true on every level. I've given you trivial examples, but everything now is chosen, including things like sexuality, including things like who I support. That wasn't the attitude here. Here, the option of choosing is not in play. You will surely open your hand. It is unthinkable not to do so. It's not even in the realm of choosing. We've gotten used to everything being a choice. I could give to the person on the street or, you know, it's a, it's a choice. I don't have to. So when you talk about really a Jewish response to hunger, so one of the things that's important to realize is it's not just a monetary issue, right? When people talk about Jewish attitudes to charity, they usually have certain kind of mantras or like memes in their head. Oh yeah, Jews, and that's like 10%, you're supposed to tithe your stuff, right? Everything gets quantified down to coin. That's not what it's about at all. It's not about the money. It's about the internal mental attitude how do I see my relationship with the other? Do I see it as toothpaste? Or do I see it as what is a good life? What am I here for? What am I doing with myself, with my time, with my gifts, with my energy? How do I look at that? It's not about like, you know, I made 100,000, so did I give 10,000 and I'm done. One of the great rabbis of the 19th century, a man named Israel Salanter. And he's called Salanter because he lived in the town of Salant. Talks about the relationship between what we think about as spiritual and what we think about as material. And he says the following, read with me, in source number three. One should be more concerned with spiritual matters than with material matters, but another person's material welfare is one's own spiritual concern. Their food is my religion. Their lack of welfare is my Judaism. We tend to bifurcate. We tend to divide up religion and the world and we say religion is like where you go to some temple-like atmosphere and you mumble some words out of a book and you do and that's religion. And we take the stuff out of the ark and we roll it open and everybody rises and it's very holy. Meanwhile, there's the people who are suffering out on the street. That's like the world. All right, so what, is, what, what does Rabbi Salanter say? Uh-uh. No, actually, that moment on the street, that's your religion. Their welfare, how we respond, how we think about what our life is, is far more significant in a spiritual sense than some sort of stereotypical notion of religion. So one of the things I want us to all think about this evening, myself at the top of the list, is how do we divide up our life? Do we think about that spiritual, emotional, religious aspect of me as contained within certain kinds of institutions, my synagogue, or etc. And then there's the me out in the world. Like, in other words, do I divide up <coughs> myself this way? Or can I begin to see a more sort of integrated idea of who I am? That when I'm out in the world doing that kind of work, that that moment when I connect with that person who's in need, that's really my core religious moment. A religious moment that is far transcending than any kind of formal religiosity that I practice elsewhere. Because that seems to be what's going on here. Now let's get back to what we were talking about before, the source that you all dissected so beautifully. 
Before it says, you will surely open your heart, sorry, surely open your hand, what does it say previously? It says, do not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your needy brother. What strikes you about that sentence? Right, and, and, and therefore, who, who's got the power here? You do. This is a choice, right? This is a choice. The emotional attitude is a choice. No one can control that, right? And you notice it doesn't say you will surely not harden your heart. It says you'll surely open your hand, right? Because on the action level, we're telling you, we don't want you to think about it. We just want you to do it. But no one can legislate your emotions. No one can do that, right? You spent time this evening listening to things that I actually found brilliant. I did. Um, but what I'm always struck by is that at the end of the day, even after all of that speaking, no one can tell you what to do with your heart. That's always going to mean a choice. It's something that after you hear people speak and so on, you have to go back to yourself and say, okay, well, what, what do I choose to be, to do? So there's a kind of plea. There's almost a begging quality in the scripture here. Do not harden your heart. The implication is, of course you could. <laughs> and of course we do every day. So it's an ask. God is making an ask. If God were up here, I don't even know if God would do as well as the other speakers, frankly. But if God were up here, that'd be it. I'm asking you. I'm begging you. It's such a poignant moment in biblical life. Because to think about it seriously is to think about God on his or her knees. Begging the human being. Well, I would say that the, the default position is you will harden it. And there's, there's a begging you not to do that. So there's, there's a tremendously pragmatic relationship to human nature here. Right? That's what's so beautiful about the passage. We know that your default instinct will be kind of like, oh, like I, I should. I, oh. We know that's going to be the default. We know that's going to be the default. I know that, because that's, that's me. I'm on the street. There's a person there with the cup, right? Um, and it, it's interesting, you know, I live in Jerusalem, right? So it's, it's interesting for me to come here because, because of the weather. <laughs> and, and that's a euphemism. The word interesting is a euphemism. But anyway, um, and it's hard to make connection in this kind of weather. It's hard for people to ask. It's even hard for them to be out there. So one of the things you get in warm weather is you get, a, there's a lot more connection. In other words, I pass by people who are asking for money every day and lots of them because they're out on the street and they're not, they're, I mean, one blessing of that is they're not freezing. And so you can't avoid it. And so I'm in this position all the time of what I'm calling the, position of, and it's all about my head and my instincts. My head is like, you know, I really should, you know, da, 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 and then my instinct is, and then what we have to do is we have to examine, like, what's that thing inside that's pulling? And like, why not? I mean, it's, it's actually pretty weird if you think about it. Like, the person's there, a quarter. Really? Like, I can't? There's something really bizarre about that, right? Why can't I give that quarter? So I got insight into this years ago. Um, because I asked a class, a chat, where I was teaching at the time, this is some time ago, um, if they feel that they have a moral obligation 
a moral obligation to give to every homeless person that they saw. I thought this was a relatively innocuous question, which shows you how clueless I really was. Um, and the, the class erupted into argument. And I mean angry argument. People were really offended. Um, and I, so then I asked a second question, because I figured if I'm in trouble, let's just drown. you know. <laughs> so I said, do you feel that the government or an authority should make it a rule that every Canadian has to give $3 a year, I picked some random small figure, that would go to feed somebody overseas. Not optional, like there's a kind of surtax that goes directly to people's food. I asked these questions. Massive debate ensued. Part of the debate was over the issue of choice, like why should I have to? Like if I want to, fine, but why should I have to? But part of it was so interesting because suspicion just oozed out, right? Suspicion. All the issue of like, did they need it was all swamped underneath the idea that I'm getting played, right? You're not talking about people who are without resources, let's put that politely. And I heard things like, how do I know they'll get it? It'll just go into some corrupt dictator's pocket. I heard that continuously. Um, and I don't see why I should have to. And don't we pay taxes for that? Right? And then the other half of the room would say things like, are you crazy? Like, what is this to you? This is nothing, you know? And then things about homeless, like how did they get to be homeless? It's sort of a blame thing, like it's your fault for being homeless. Anyway, I'm not going to get into all of the back and forth. It was quite a long time. It took several days, actually, to process all this. But the, the sort of common denominator emotion was exactly the sound I made before, which is just... <laughs> and if you think about it, that's insane. We're asking you if you could give $3 a year, less than a coffee. And you're screaming about that. So what I want you to think about, I don't have any grand conclusions about this, by the way. I'm, I'm opening it up for thought. What does this mean? What does this mean about us as human beings in the West that we're so rattled by that idea that we find it so affronting, so assaulting. And how can we get over that tug, that claim somehow, and be free of it? And which is why the Bible really says, we're going to take this out of the realm of your choosing, of your thinking. This is just going to be something we do. Because we don't want you to sit there and agonize about whether to give the quarter to the person who's freezing because there's something insane about that. So we're not going to give the language of choice. The only choice you're going to have is do not harden your heart. That's what we have to work on, right? Notice the Bible is not talking about money, not talking about quantity, it's not talking about price, it's talking about emotions. Because emotions and your relationship to the part of you that is not sure how to give, why to give, what to give, that's the part that's interesting. Why do I harden it? What would, what would be the big deal? Why am I suspicious? And I'm not here to judge. And I'm not here to say whether your suspicions are warranted or not. We're here to explore what it is in us that does that thing. Could you go back and explore a little further the donating to every supplicant that one sees on the street and how that relates to your feeling that you should, that you can't, or you can, and is there any limit? Right, so that's a good question, right? Should we donate to every supplicant on the street? What would be the criteria? Um, should we or shouldn't we? Well, I'm going to answer that question by asking you, what do you think the criteria would be for making that decision? Unfortunately, it would come back to quantity. OK. So quantity being how many people are asking you? Over, in my 
five paragraph stations on, on, on the street, uh, I might come across five supplicants a day. Okay. You give them each a dollar. Yep. And that's $150 a month. $1,500 a year. Right. Um, there are limits to what I can give. Is this the best way of me responding to that inner demand, that inner feeling? Um, or do I say I'm only going to give half on the street and I'm going to add their half to Mazan? It becomes a dilemma and a quantitative one as much as a moral one. What if you gave each of them a quarter? Would that make me feel, would that make them, uh, would that do them any good? If the next hundred people gave them a quarter, it would do them a lot of good. I'm only responsible for me. Correct. So why worry about it? Think about <laughs> what resources you have and think about the idea that I'm going to give to everybody, but I'm just going to give what I feel I can give. Because by the way, that part of it, I mean, if you're asking me, it depends how you're asking me. If you're asking me from a Jewish point of view, yeah, you could give them a quarter. You can give them a dime. It's not a question of how much you're giving, right? The issue is that each person gets responded to in some way. So we, we and that, that's why I've been trying to talk about the difference between an attitude and financial. People's attitude to charity unfortunately, has become entirely quantified by the issue of money, which seems obvious because it is about money. But it turns out it's really not about money. It turns out that at the end of the day, it's really about something much deeper. And the money flows out of that. So yeah, I would unequivocally say that you could try to give to as many people as possible within whatever means you deem possible, because the, the experience will be life-changing. Right? If you try an experiment for, say, one month, one week, give to every single person who asks you. I'm not talking about some large-scale thing where people come to your door and ask for a large, but that person on the street. Every single person I'm going to give a quarter to. Every single one. And not only am I going to give them a quarter, but I'm going to say something to them. I'm going to say, take care of yourself. I'm going to look at them. One of the things that changed my life was when I heard somebody talking about giving and talking only about the things you say to somebody. Because I had previously been in the mode where I would give money, feel like I was a really terrific human being, um, but I really wouldn't say much. It was actually much worse than that. To be honest, I would feel a sense of repugnance. I'd sort of look away, half turn, be a little scared even, a little revulsed. And I realized this is insane. I'm treating it like I'm God's gift and um, they're uh, out of a horror movie. And I just sort of, right? So I realized there's so much more to it. It's, it's the quantity, but it's also the nature of the interaction. And just trying to, because otherwise our whole scope is far too grandiose. I'm not going to save anybody's life on that level, on that street level. All I can do is do a little good thing each time. So the question is whether emotionally I can just gear myself to doing that little good thing all the time and see what happens to me, whether that's transformative for me in terms of doing that on a consistent basis. So yeah, I would say give to everyone within your means and try not to see that as a contradiction. Yeah, sure, of course. So what you said about the, um, you know, an experiment of giving to everyone who, who asks. Yeah. Um, so I actually took that experiment upon myself in high school, thanks to my favorite, at the time, Jewish leader who happened to be the lead singer of a punk rock band that I liked, who was Jewish, who mentioned it in, a, in an article. And I did take up the practice. I was, you know, I was in high school. I had babysitting money. It was I yeah. didn't have much to give, but also my needs were met. I was living with family, and what? And again, to also to come back to the question of what what is the underlying emotional process that makes that eh feeling? Yeah. Like what is it when we all know 
whether it's to give every single time or what to give to, we all know we probably could do a little more than we currently do. And why don't we? One thing that I've reflected on is I think an unconscious belief, like culture-wide, that I think more of us hold more deeply than we consciously think we do. Um, a belief that people who are less fortunate, the people who are asking, um, that there is, that there's that suspicion, that they, they must have made some wrong choice. There must have been something that they did that I would never do, that put them in that position that has protected me from it. And I think it's a self-protective narrative that we have culturally. I think we don't, we want to imagine that we are invulnerable to that kind of bad luck. And it's easier to say there must be something that they did, completely unconsciously. I don't think anyone thinks this when you pass someone on the street. But challenging yourself to look at each of those people and say something and recognize that there's no difference except bad luck. And to give whatever you can whenever you have something in your pocket, just as a practice of challenging yourself. I do feel like you said it changed your life. It did change my life. Maybe that's why I'm in nonprofits now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a piece of that where you're assuming that they made a bad choice. I mean, look, to be, um, so to speak, charitable to everyone, <laughs> um, we're overwhelmed. That's the truth. Yeah. The m modern living, especially contemporary living, especially post-social media living, is to be bombarded. That's the experience of life now. You're bombarded constantly by people's images, by people's needs, by people's wants, by stories after stories after stories. And there's a sense that I get from the people, not only the people I teach, but the people I speak to, that there's a deep sense of drain, of burnout, of exhaustion on a very deep level that people aren't even conscious of sometimes. You know, E.M. Forster, the great English novelist, and Howard Zen once wrote that, and he was being ironic, he said, like, the very poor are unthinkable. Right? In other words, it's not something you want to really deal with because it's overwhelming, because there's too many of them, and what difference can I make anyway? And so if I give my dollar, and that was part of what happened in that chat conversation. It was not just that they didn't want to, but they were actually rationalizing it post facto as a futile gesture anyway. As Per, as teenager after teenager told me, what difference is my three bucks going to make anyway? There's just going to be another one, and another one, and another one. And you know what? That's true. But it's only true, and that's what you and I were talking about before, it's only true if we see ourselves in isolation. Right? So, will my three dollars make a big difference in the world? No. But I'm not I cannot think about whether other people are going to give their three dollars, right? When the Torah commands you, it's not sitting there and saying you and you and you and you and you. It's saying you. Because that's all it is interested in at that moment. It's directed to the soul of each individual. It's not asking you to think about what everybody else is doing, right? Like, God bless the people who do do that. But for the most part, most of us, it's what, what can I think about without worrying about what other people are doing or thinking or saying? Yeah? There are six, over 65,000 registered charities in Canada. So we have to make choices. Yeah. Because we can't give to everybody. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a, that's a pretty awesome statistic. Yeah. It really is. And my guess would be, I'm ignorant, but my guess would be that a lot of them are super worthy, mm -hmm. right? Poor people, hungry people, blind people, sick people, sick people disabled people, and on and on and on. And you're right, you, you, can't, you can't give to all of them. So, but I think that there's, there's a kind of macro giving and a kind of micro giving, right? And this gets back to the question you asked me before. So if you want like the hard data fact of halakha, so halakha says, Jewish law says, you give to everybody who asks you. Not on the check writing level, on the quarter to the homeless person on the street level. Yeah, you give to every single person that asks you and you don't interrogate them. And that's actually codified in that language. You give and you don't inquire. That's the language in the Talmud and in my mind. Nothing could be plainer. 
It's not obscure. It's not like dressed up religious language. It's bang. Every person who asks, you give, do not interrogate. They're thinking about it on small scale. You're talking about big scale, and yeah, there I think it's obvious that you have to think in a discretionary way about where your resources are going to go, and also that you should be able to sustain your giving in future years. So that's a very individualized decision, the money. On my first trip to Israel, um, I was standing in front of the wall, and a lady came up to me. And I gave her some. And I was sworn to the point where yeah. I was scared to death that I was going to get trampled in the onslaught of people coming back. There's that too, right? There's that too. But, you know, there's, if, there's, no, um, there's no manual for this. You know, there's no like perfect scientific grid. How much to each person and what do I know? It's, it's instinctive, which is why I'm trying to talk about just the little movement internally, attitudinally, where you just try and open yourself a little more. Here's a, here's a real story. So I'm the one in the family who's the like, not my wife. My wife is a natural giver, right? And we'll have these conversations where I'll be tearing my hair out, right? Here's a story that happened to us six months ago. Yep. Um, in a neighborhood in Jerusalem, um, approached by a guy. We're outside the variety store. It's about 9 o'clock at night. We've gone to buy, I guess, milk or something. Guy comes up, right? And my wife gives quite a bit more than, a, like a lot more than a quarter, let's put it that way, to this guy who then marches into the store and, finish the sentence for me? Cigarettes. Buy cigarettes. cigarettes, exactly right. Exactly right. And buy cigarettes. So, I'm going to be honest, right? I am irritated. I am. I'm irritated. Um, you know, the uh, part of me has become a full-grown, right? And she looks at me, like she always does, very calmly, and says, it's not my job to monitor what he did with my money. Because if I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm like the police. I'm going to like walk around and, and chase people and see what they do with my money. You know. Now, I was just embarrassed. I was. Because it was so obvious to me how right she was and how immature I was being. So that's the thing, is that you make decisions, but the, the business of turning charity into like I'm part of MI5 or like the Shin Bet or the CIA, that has to go. Like we, we have to somehow be able to shed that attitude, even if it means giving a little bit less but feeling less grudging about it, just to prepare us for the ability to give more. Because in the long run, the giving will come when the heart stops hardening. And if, and, and if to get to that point means that I'm a little bit more modest at the beginning, but I shed this feeling of constantly needing to monitor the money I give, then it's probably better in the long run. Okay, so I just want to move forward. I don't want to spend too much more time here with you. Um, but I do want you to turn the page, and I want you to take a look at this chart about contemporary Jewish giving. Okay. So Jewish donors are generous on a cross-religious scale. This has been shown in many studies that I've read. Um, and Jews are actually really good at giving to things that go beyond the Jewish community. Um, but I want, what I want you to take a look at is the bottom of the page, because I think this is really crucial. The last five lines. Jews in their 20s and 30s said they are less likely to give to Jewish organizations than are their parents' and grandparents' generations. 49% of Jewish donors under 40 give to a Jewish nonprofit, compared with 63% of those over 40. The finding echo studies by the Pew Research Center and others that say young people are more likely than older ones to lack religious affiliation. 
Now, this is a truth. This has been shown in a lot of data. And you can look at this truth in a negative or a positive way. On the negative side, it, there's definitely a trend to feeling less affiliated communally Jewishly, right? As the statistics in every other area of Jewish life show a kind of growing disaffection with Judaism, so too it has implications for giving specifically to Jewish stuff. On the other hand, the positive is that, and I, I prefer to look at it positively, is that younger people think in a universalistic way. They're not as particularistic. They're able to um, say with conviction, I'm a member of the human community, I'm a member of the human race, and my concerns transcend the parochial. I look at all people as possible recipients of whatever it is that I have to give. If you don't get younger people involved with giving while they're younger, every study shows you lose them. Meaning that if families model giving when kids are still young, even in their 20s, it becomes part of their rhythm. So what I'm saying now is that the uh, that I feel is transmittable. <laughs> it's epigenetic. It crosses over. Meanwhile, my non-hardened heart, to the extent that I cannot harden it, also is transmittable. Um, so we all are thinking night and day from the time our children leave the womb about how we can make them the best people they can be, the happiest people they can be, the most secure people they can be. Every parent in this room knows that that runs in our blood. This is a piece of it. What my attitude to giving, my attitude, how I look at that homeless person in the street while my kid is with me, that's a big transmission. And we can rationalize it all we like, and I'm certainly not trying to make anybody feel guilty because that's not my thing. We can rationalize it all we like, but that crosses over. So we can talk, talk, talk to them about staka and all that funky things that we say in Judaism, but it's that moment what I, what I identified before is the core religious moment. That's what passes over. That's what crosses into their bloodstream, right? For my kids, my wife's non-interrogating, this is what we do, and she does it with zero fanfare. Zero is what got transmitted, thank God. Not my, uh, but her, okay. He bought cigarettes. Um, and everybody has to think about that. Again, this is, there's a typical thing in the West where we think of ourselves as autonomous, atomized, isolated people. In Africa, when a gift comes to somebody in the village, everybody comes. Everybody shares in the gift. Because there's an ethos of commun communality that we don't have. Our community, at the very least, is our families. Right? That's our community. And to the extent that we're able to think clearly about not hardening our hearts, that's one of the greatest values, one of the greatest gifts we'll ever, ever, ever give our kids. That they'll grow up with that. So <clears throat> in the next moment, when we think about not giving that quarter, so don't give it for yourself. Give it for what you want to transmit to somebody else. Anyway, let's start where, let's finish where we started. All of you would save the drowning kid. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> let's look at how Peter Singer talks about this in the last part of the sheet. <clears throat> According to UNICEF, nearly 10 million children under five years old die each year from causes related to poverty. <clears throat> Here's one case described to a researcher from the World Bank. A small boy died today of measles. We all know he could have been cured at the hospital, but the parents had no money. 
So the boy died a slow and painful death, not of measles, but out of poverty. Think about something like that happening 27,000 times every day. Some children die because they don't have enough to eat, more die from measles, malaria, <clears throat> etc. He goes on to talk about how these children are vulnerable, they don't have clean water, they don't have food, and so on. He concludes the following at the last paragraph. Now think about your own situation. By donating a relatively small amount of money, you could save a child's life. Maybe it takes more than the amount needed to buy a pair of shoes, but we all spend money on things we don't really need, whether on drinks, meals out, clothing, movies, concerts, vacations, new cars, or house renovation. <clears throat> Is it possible that by choosing to spend your money on such things rather than contributing to an aid agency, you're leaving a child to die, a child you could have saved? He's obviously being provocative. He's trying to get under your skin. He's trying to say, you, who all said you wouldn't save the kid, you're drowning him every day, thousands of times a day. Now, he's not stupid. He understands that I can't save these 27,000 kids. So again, he's talking about attitude. He's talking about the idea, uh, there's so many things that are encapsulated here. Why would we save the kid drowning? Because the kid's in front of me, right? We have a lot of trouble thinking about charity vis-a-vis -vis proximity. One of the reasons people don't give is that it's not in front of them. It's far away. It's like another galaxy. Even the stories you heard tonight, which are taking place in our city, for many people, that's another galaxy. If it's not right in front of me, literally, then it just feels too far away. Those are our tendencies. So all I'm here to talk about is what are our tendencies? Why do we do things that we do? Because we have certain prefabricated ways of thinking about the world. It's over there. Do they really need it? I couldn't solve the problem anyway. There's too many of them. You realize that at the moment when you're in front of the person on the street and they're at, and it's just a quarter, and it's no big deal, that the reason we're really not giving the quarter is that all of those things that we've already ingested as part of our mental system, they all kick in. You know, there's one, there's, there's, right, what you talked about before, there's, there's thousands of them, if I give him, da -da 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 it's all unconscious, all happening, and so I, I walk on by. Of course, and you add in the factors I talked about earlier, it's a little bit revolting, it's scary, I don't want to, they're crazy, whatever it is you're thinking on an unconscious level, it all sort of wells up. And so the insane fact of the matter, which is I didn't give a quarter to a homeless guy, which afterwards, sort of in the you know, debriefing, the rational debriefing, like, are you out of your mind? But suddenly, but it's, it's palatable at the time, because I didn't realize like all of this stuff in me like welled up to say like, eh. and that's how it is, right? Doesn't even require language, it's just, eh. So that's all, that's all. That's all we have to think about on some level, right? Is just day by day, can I turn the needle a little bit in terms of how I think about it, in terms of what I think is a good life? What's my relationship to others near and far? What's my responsibility? And frankly, what do I want to be in this world? I'll just end on this. David Brooks has a lovely binary. He calls resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtue, which is really how we present ourselves most of our lives. And it's one of the reasons I actually don't like being introduced, don't like my bio spoken about, because I don't think it's relevant. Right? He went to this school, he got that degree, he's got this thing, he's got these honors. Those are resume virtues. Eulogy virtues are, who were you? Were you courageous? Were you honest? Were you brave? Were you dignified? Were you loving? Were you compassionate? Who were you? There's nobody here, nobody in the world, who doesn't want to be known by their eulogy virtue. And yet we spend most of our life cultivating the resume virtue. The work that these people are doing is about a eulogy virtue. It's who we are. It's our best self. It's what we all want to be. Thanks very much.